Okay, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about some problems that we've been working on in refining the conformational ensembles of flexible systems. Um, but first I want to just briefly thank all the members of the CASM lab who've um, helped with this project and our collaborators in the Columbus lab at the University of Virginia, particularly um, Marissa Kieber who has done all of the spectroscopic experiments that you're going to see today. And then finally, I want to thank the Blue Waters program. I was a Blue Waters graduate fellow um, this past year, and it's been um, an amazing experience that's really accelerated the pace of my research, so thank you. Um, okay, so flexible proteins are really quite difficult to study because so many states contribute to their conformational ensembles. and. Um, Ideally, we'd have some experimental or computational technique that would report on all the conformational heterogeneity of the system at atomistic level resolution. But of course, that's just not the way that the world works. Um, instead, there seems to be a broad trade-off between how many degrees of freedom you can resolve and then how much of the conformational heterogeneity of the system you can capture. And so the question for us has been, how do you leverage all of these different techniques to build up an estimate of your system that contains all the information about heterogeneity at atomic level resolution? And so what I've been working on throughout the course of my PhD has been how to drive this iterative um, refinement procedure of flexible ensembles. And so the idea is that you would start um, with some uh, experiments. Then you would use computation to integrate those experimental data. And then what I'll be talking about today specifically is you would then use the computational output to optimally select the next round of experiments that you'd perform. And I think that this is really cool because I think a lot of people have been thinking about how to do the integration piece of all of this. Um, but maybe not as many have been focusing on the experiment selection. And um, this question of leveraging multiple techniques and in particular selecting experiments came about because of a specific system that our collaborators were studying and that's this opa CCAM interaction. Um, so OPA proteins are eight-stranded beta barrel outer membrane proteins of Neisserial species and they bind to CCAM proteins on the target cell. And this binding event triggers cellular uptake of the bacteria. And so this is really important, obviously, from an infectious disease perspective. Um, but then there are also some really interesting uh, biophysical pieces of the interaction. So the OPA loops are incredibly sequence variable and incredibly mobile but they actually recognize their receptors with high affinity, nanomolar affinity. So the question is, how on earth does this binding event take place if you don't have any binding motifs and no clear structures that are obviously engaging in binding? And so our collaborators were initially studying actually just the APO system because they wanted to understand the changes to the loop ensemble upon CCAM engagement. Um, but they were doing this with uh, an experimental technique called double electron electron resonance. And this is a spectroscopic uh, technique that yields distance distributions between pairs of nitroxide labeled residues. And so this is great because it gives us distributions, it tells us about the heterogeneity. Um, but you only get on the order of about uh, 10 measurements for your, for your given system because the experiments are performed um, sequentially and they take uh, quite a bit of time. And so, um, and, and you'll actually need about on the order of 10,000 measurements for a system like this because if you just think about the combinatorial space of um, all of the different pairs, if you just think about the interloop pairs, um, how many different ones you could possibly measure, that space sort of explodes. Uh, and so, uh, they, they were trying to figure out, okay, well, which pairs are best for us to measure? And that's where we came in and tried to leverage MD simulations to try to do the pair selection. 
Okay, so how do we actually do this? Um, broadly speaking, we use information theoretic measures to select pairs that do two things. Number one, we want them to provide the most information about which conformation the system is in. And then two, we want them to be minimally redundant with each other. So uh, when we use this algorithm on a molecular simulation data of the APO ensemble, what we see is what's shown on the right. So in the top structure, I'm showing the top five pairs that were um, selected using only the first criterion. So just this maximum informativeness or uh, maximum relevance to the ensemble. And you can see um, that, that this probably isn't the optimal set of pairs because they're all bunched up together. And so presumably they're going to yield essentially the same information uh, about the ensemble. But once we do the redundancy correction, right, when we include this, this second condition, what we get are the pairs that are shown on the bottom there. And you can see that they are um, much better dispersed across the loops. OK, so now we've got a way to select the pairs and perform the experiments. And so the question is, what do you do with the resulting data? You've got to integrate it to get an approximation of your conformational ensemble. And you've got to do this in a way that goes beyond just simple spring potentials, right? Because that's not going to get at the higher order moments of the distributions. And of course, the whole point here is that we want to get the full heterogeneity of the system right. So the way that we get around this problem is by running ensemble simulations in which we apply biasing potentials that drive the full um, ensemble MD simulation distribution to the experimental targets. And you can see that um, on the right, we're able to do this quite well. Here I'm showing an example of um, four distributions after uh, 100 nanoseconds of simulation per ensemble member. And um, the, the distributions uh, are shown in um, colored dashes and they converge quite well to the underlying targets. And I just wanna pause briefly here and, and say one more thing about the incorporation. So this method that I just described in the previous slide is totally sufficient to handle the distributions, the types of distributions that we got um, in the uh, OPA ensemble. But it turns out it isn't quite robust enough to handle slightly more complicated distributions, particularly ones where you have uh, really well separated probability uh, densities. And so you can see in the, in the bottom figure that actually this uh, restrained ensemble method damps out exchange between the two different probability modes. And, and of course, it's really important to get at that far mode um, you would see this sort of thing with, with lots of different biological systems, really anything that has an open and closed state. So it's important to be able to, to uh, capture these sorts of distributions. Uh, and so we've been developing methodologies that can handle these distributions. And this is where, um, this is one area where Blue Waters has been just absolutely essential in um, scaling up to many ensemble members and actually sampling these transitions. So uh, if you want more information about that, please come see my poster tonight. I'll, I'll have a little bit more on, on this particular piece of the, the project. Um, okay, so back to OPA CCAM and uh, this MRMR driven refinement. So here's what we did. We um, performed one round of refinement using two different ensembles, one in which we incorporated a set of these high scoring, um, highly informative pairs, and then one in which we incorporated uh, a set of pairs that were selected by um, spectroscopists who were blinded to our method. Um, they were using typical structure guided uh, selection of, of pairs that's sort of state of the art in the field right now. And I should say, 
We also did a, a second round of refinement using the first MRMR ensemble to select uh, additional optimal pairs. So that's why I've got three different um, ensembles shown here. But uh, at any rate, um, what we saw was in the uh, MRMR restrained ensemble, we did much better at predicting pairs that had not been used in the refinement process. So this chart um, that, that I'm showing is uh, eight additional pairs that had been left out of the first round. And in this case, um, bigger means more agreement with the underlying um, experimental target. And you can see that in seven of the eight pairs, uh, the MRMR ensemble does much better. Uh, it's, it agrees far more with the, the experimental targets. Um, and then in the last case, we tie with the, the spectroscopist um, selected pairs. So, so this is already looking really promising, um, but ultimately we want to gain some biological insight. Okay, so I'm showing here 10 conformational clusters that were identified after two rounds of this simulation guided spectroscopy. Um, and I should just point out here that the loops are colored in this figure according to the uh, regions of high sequence variability that, that I had mentioned at the beginning of the talk. So there are two hypervariable regions shown in red and green and then a semi-variable region shown in tan. Um, okay, so 60% of these structures show a really well-defined loop-loop interaction pattern. Um, one loop seems to be extended laterally from the base of the barrel and then the other two loops come together to form fairly close contacts. <coughs> and so we hypothesized that uh, OPA is engaging its receptor in potentially one of two ways. Either um, uh, CCAM is binding directly to the extended loop, or it may be binding to some kind of interface that's formed by two of the interacting loops. And so to test this, we ran some additional DIRA experiments on two highly informative pairs with and without CCAM. And we found that certain um, populations were dramatically increasing upon CCAM binding. And so we reweighted the conformational clusters that I showed in the previous slide uh, from the APO ensemble in order to determine how the relative populations of those conformations uh, change upon binding. And the results were, were really striking. Um, the HV2 extended conformations in the reweighted ensemble account for 75% for of that ensemble, and, and they had um, only accounted for 20% in the, in the APO ensemble. So here I'm showing just one of the HV2 extended conformations. And you can see that the labeled distances there correspond well with the populations that are increasing in the, the deer experiments shown at the top. So we're pretty confident that it's the HV2 extended uh, conformation that's being selected out by CCAM binding. <coughs> so this is really cool. Um, by incorporating these optimally selected pairs, we learned some really important things about the OPA CCAM system and specifically which conformation is, is likely engaging CCAM. But of course, to determine um, exactly how the two are, are interacting, we have some more work to do. We want to do some more sophisticated binding experiments. Um, specifically, we want to do some, some DIR experiments between OPA and CCAM rather than these OPA-OPA pairs. Uh, and then we want to also do additional simulations and integrate those data to try to get at the, um, the atomistic detail uh, of the interaction. So that's where we're going next.